and for yourself? <laughs> I don't know if we need to go through the kind of um, uh, everyone. This is uh, <laughs> Mike and I know each other. We're mates. Uh, we've known each other for twelve years, and I think we met in a bar at some point. <laughs> we were in Cambridge. Uh, we were in Cambridge somewhere, but um, um, Philippa and uh, Heta and the other people at Imperial do a whole load of really exciting, like forwards looking kind of formal verification and tool building. Uh, and uh, and I think that this is, uh, the stuff that they're gonna talk about today has a lot of relevance for what we're doing in that I think that, um, I think that there's a lot of overlap between sort of like in terms of goals, but I think that what they're trying to do is sort of forge forward and do a bunch of experimental work about what really is possible in this kind of like static analysis for um, which is kind of space uh, testing and um, symbolic execution. So I'm, you know, I'm always excited to see what Imperial have come up with. So um, I think it'll be a fun one. So yeah, Philippa, please go ahead. Thank you. And just while um, Sasha and Petra have got their videos on, uh, these guys are co-authors and they will be on the chat um, for my part of the talk. And uh, Sasha and I will be on the chat for Petra's part of the talk. So feel free, things you're not um, uh, getting to ping in chat and uh, also ping out loud. I don't need to talk. I'm going to share now. So hello everybody, I'm uh, uh, Philippa Gardner and I'm going to talk about Gillian, which is um, a platform for compositional symbolic analysis. And in particular, today I'm going to talk about verification for JavaScript code and C code. And I'm giving the first part of the talk and Petter will give the second part of the talk on uh, verification of AWS code. There's, as well as Petta here, there's also Jose, who used to be at Imperial and has just moved to um, Lisbon uh, as an academic, and Sasha, who's a PhD student. Let me just give you a little bit of history of what we've done with uh, JavaScript. So all the way back to 2012, we were doing a separation logic for a featherweight uh, JavaScript. Then in 2014, this is the first time that we got anywhere near real world. And in particular, we, would, we did a cock mechanized specification of ECMAScript 5 strict, for those of you who know um, what that means, it's a standard. And it uh, was done with Imperial and Inria and had lots of people working on it. These two came together um, for something called Javert, which is verification for um, big chunks of um, JavaScript code. Here we did um, Coset, which was symbolic testing for JavaScript uh, code, very much using uh, the infrastructure that came from Chauvet. And one thing that's going on with our group, we're, we're quite technical and uh, we um, like to simplify our technical work. So in particular, Jose was honing and honing and honing what was going on here and ended up finding the common structure. So here we do um, uh, unified symbolic analysis, doing whole program symbolic testing, verification, and bioabductive execution. We offshoot to some work on JavaScript events, but really the main path I want to concentrate on now is um, the step to uh, um, Gillian. So the stuff in blue is about JavaScript. And now with Gillian, we're on a multi-language platform and we're illustrating this point by um, JavaScript and C. You can see it's very new work. Here we did um, symbolic testing. Now we're just about to publish on verification. 
So Gillian is a unified, uh, unifies symbolic analysis. We can do whole program symbolic testing using a core execution engine. And there the idea is that the code developer puts in first order assertions um, in the code and with symbolic input, symbolic output, either gets bounded correctness results or concrete uh, counter models. This is a normal symbolic execution um, story. We've, uh, we've also do, uh, doing full verification, and this is the work we'll talk about today. And basically the idea, it's a much more uh, specialist code developer now, who's putting lots and lots of annotations throughout the code and being quite sophisticated in building up the abstractions necessary to specify functions. Or we get functional correctness guarantees or totally unreadable failing symbolic traces that um, Petter and Sasha can read and not many others at the moment, though we are trying to do better. And finally, we have compositional symbolic testing using the by abduction technique. This is for the general developer. There's almost no annotations. You either get bounded correctness uh, specifications or lightweight uh, bug reports. Here, we're very much in the realm of algorithm at the moment, no way near real world code, we will get there. Uh, the people who have made this work famous, of course, is the Facebook for people. So the Gillian platform comprises the following infrastructure. We have Jill, which is an intermediate go-to language. Uh, I don't think people are surprised about that in any way. We uh, um, are working with a go-to language. What is less uh, common is that it's parametric on the memory model of the target language. And we are really, really um, quite strong about that. We um, actually visited a couple of times uh, Gawa in 2018, I think. And what we found is that there's quite a bit of resonance between um, now the Gillian before the Javert work and SOAR. So what's happening with SOAR is that the memory model, that you have different memory models linking to your um, intermediate representation and you're doing it at the level of the uh, low level representations of languages such as LLVM or JVM. Um, here, we are um, bringing that interface out to a tool developer that might want to instantiate um, Gillian with a particular uh, target language. We have a first order solver powered by the Z3 theorem prover, and there's many, many people more expert than that on, uh, on this work. We've got good performance um, results, but we're no experts here. And the thing that we really like is that we've got this modular analysis, first execution, then verification so that we can specify um, functions and then the bioductive reasoning. So there's two types of users. There's the code developer and there's the, uh, excuse me, there's the tool developer and the code developer. So first I'm thinking about the code, to, uh, the tool developer. I'm getting it wrong already. Um, so in particular, to instantiate Gillian with a target language, a tool developer needs to do the following things. It needs to give a compiler from the target language to our, our intermediate go-to language that's not so very special. And it needs to... Um, uh, give OCaml implementations of the concrete and symbolic memory. In particular for us, the compiler needs to be what we're calling trusted. It means it preserves the memory models and it preserves the semantics. We did this in gory detail for our Javert compiler. And in particular, we were absolutely line by line close to what was going in on the standard, very much wanting to um, uh, preserve the memory. The idea is really the memory models are staying the same. There's no optimization 
And the, all that's going on is that the complicated control flow associated with a particular language is getting represented by go-to structure in Geo. We also need to uh, give the, uh, the memory models, and we give two, the concrete memory model and the symbolic memory model. Sometimes the structure of these are very similar to each other, and sometimes they're not for performance reasons. So that's why we have in both. And in particular, the concrete memory model allows us to test the compiler and test things very well before we work on um, the symbolic memory model that can sometimes be much uh, more complicated. And we do this using basic actions, core predicates and fixes corresponding to the three types of analysis, basic action for symbolic um, execution, core predicates for the verification, fixes for the by abduction. A basic action, you think of it like, it, given a tiny heap cell, a basic action gets and sets associated with that um, heap cell. The core predicate just lifts the heap cell to um, uh, cell assertions. For those of you who know the basic separation logic, it's doing the, it's having an assertion corresponding, a cell assertion corresponding to um, a heap cell. And then fixes are there to say, given errors that are to do with resource, you can fix that information um, and carry on the resource given by the um, separation logic. We've got three example instantiations we're working with at the moment. Tiny while for teaching and experimentation. And I really mean this tiny while is really, really nice. And for example, we um, can teach a, a course to the MSc students that's working with this tiny while language without them needing all the gory details of JavaScript and C. So then for JavaScript, we need an extensible object memory model and we need uh, and the implementation of such, and we need a trusted compiler, and we use the um, Chabert trusted compiler. And for C, we have a completely different sort of memory model. It's a block offset memory model, and we are very lucky. We have the Comcert compiler, which is a very trusted um, compiler, so we can pinch their work rather than having to uh, worry about that ourselves. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, three things in this talk, in Chilean in theory, Chilean instantiations, and Chilean in practice. And Chilean in practice, I'll give a small overview, and then uh, Petter will uh, give more details about the verification. So first, Chilean in theory. We have this core execution engine that is formalized here by these rules, and I'm not expecting you to re read them at all. And if you don't like reading formal semantics, you can read an OCaml implementation that closely follows these rules. We have um, basic actions, which can I just say there is a person walking around with the video and I just love it. Please continue. I'm not asking you to, pull, to stop, but it's just absolutely lovely to have a little bit of human interaction as I'm giving this talk. So um, for the basic actions, what we're going to do is this fundamental actions between the language and its memory. And the actions are given like this. So these are things, I mean, it's formalism. Um, uh, so it's written in a uh, gobbledygook notation. But basically, you have to give the actions, then you lift it up to the symbolic execution. And then we have verification that allows us to specify functions. And this is the first time we can do this. We can't do this at the symbolic execution engine. And to do this, we need core predicates. And these core predicates are these cell assertions in uh, separation logic when we're talking about a simple um, heap. And as well as the core predicates, we need something called uh, consumers and producer actions for each core predicate. In other words, uh, other words we've heard um, used are inhale and exhale actions. So the idea is you've got your um, symbolic memory, you've got a core predicate. What does this mean to unify the core predicate 
with the symbolic memory and can be done in many ways. There's many matches. And for a match, you consume it and then you do your update and you produce the result, meaning you put the um, resulting assertion back in the um, main memory. So the um, producer, the consumer and producer actions are, start off from these core predicates and then can lift up to the assertions in the fragment of separation logic we're dealing with. For those of you who know a lot about separation logic, we're using the same fragment as every other tool uses. So on top of the symbolic ex uh, execution engine, we have these additional rules. And in particular, we have unfold fold um, rules for the user to find predicates, a rule for function call, and a rule to lift up from the symbolic execution engine to this logical place, this one here. So user to find functions, we need them for two reasons. One reason is, the tool developer needs to um, build abstractions to get to the place where the code developer likes to work. So the code does, the developer doesn't know all the nitty gritty of the um, uh, fine grained stuff to do with the language. It works with um, uh, much more complete structures. And so it's getting to the what we're hoping is the natural interface of that um, uh, uh, core developer and their code developer. And then the code developer has their own programs that they're writing with their own data structures, and they need to also do user defined predicates. So, and what's happening is um, the, to unfold predicates, sometimes it can be done automatically. Sometimes you need a bit of help with some annotations. The folding ones happen automatically. And I'd like to continue in this frame for a little bit and um, explain a bit more about the um, function call. So we've got this symbolic state and we've got the um, function specification. And we need to match this um, precondition to the symbolic state. And we do this by unification and in particular, find the substitution needed in order for a bit of the symbolic state to match the P. Again, there can be lots of ways this can be done. So then what we do is we consume it leaving the frame in place, and we put back the um, post condition, this Q with the appropriate substitutions. So this is quite a simple thing to explain at this level. It actually took us a long time uh, to fully understand this and fully formalize this. Um, at this high level, it's quite simple to explain. Finally, I want to talk about by abduction. So in the core execution engine, we are very, very careful about the errors. And in particular, with the errors, we are able to fix some of them. We can't fix the type errors, but we can fix errors to do with missing resource, resource in the sense of uh, separation logic. And an error can have many possible type of fixes. So actually the tool developer needs to work quite subtly there. And again, I don't expect you to um, read the rule, but basically all by abduction is, is one extra rule on top of the rules we've so far given. And this extra rule says, if an action fails with a given fix, produce that fix in the current state, meaning that fix is an assertion and you can put it back on to the rest of the uh, memory as long as certain um, uh, first order formula are satisfiable and re-execute the action. We've got general correctness results if you wish to prove them. So a tool developer might not care or a tool developer might decide that they do want to um, uh, prove these general correctness results, that, uh, uh, prove these results. 
So basically, we have a parametric correctness result. So all you have to do is prove the results for the basic actions, the core predicates, and the fixes. So for symbolic execution, you have to show the correctness of the symbolic actions with respect to the concrete actions. Simple soundness result. This is what we've done. We've got forward soundness. We've got forward completeness. Um, and this is enough to give uh, no false positives. And we have backwards completeness. This is new. So the first two were in our PLDI paper last year. And this backwards completeness result was very much done because of the incorrectness uh, separation logic work. And we took, we went, can we do this? And we went, oh yeah, that is easy. So we were absolutely resonating the, with these guys. Really not so surprising given that we're a place where we're unifying um, uh, testing and verification and we're understanding it better with this new work. We also have um, bounded verification guarantees. With the uh, um, function specification, we need um, to do the full uh, verification guarantees. That's saying that the frame makes sense with respect to actions, but well, with respect to these core predicates. And then for by abduction, we have that we don't have false positives as long as the fixes are not over approximating or no over approximating specifications are used. Again, resonances with the incorrectness work. It's very uh, 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 compelling for us. And we have bounded verification guarantees as long as the fixes are not under approximating. That's our theoretical work. Now I want to go to Gillian instantiations. And if you got a bit lost in some of that theory, I was doing it at a very high level. Really don't worry because um, the next bit doesn't rely on it. Um, the main thing to understand and know is we're going to have, we talk about basic actions and core predicates and fixes. So there's two instantiations we're doing, JavaScript and C. So as I said, we're working with the concrete and symbolic memory models. What I have not emphasized until now is that we're working with compositional memory models, very much in the spirit of the old separation logic work of the past. So in order to get compositionality, we have to, um, we have identified something that I think it's been around in various places. I first know it from our work on um, uh, concurrency uh, 2010, but um, it comes up every, every now and again, which is um, basic actions have to account with not just positive and missing information, but also negative information. What I mean by that is negative information is information that's not there. If you allocate something, and for example, in JavaScript, if you are um, allocating an object, you know what properties are there, you know what properties are not there. And so you can give this information. This information is not missing. It's real, real information about something not being there. And with it, we can do compositional memory models for JavaScript and for C. And what we are um, very surprised about, mm, uh, no, not so surprised about, but we're really clarifying our intuition now, is that we always had JavaScript uh, memory model with the negative information and in particular explicit absence of the object properties. What we now have is also very similar um, results with C. And it, the analogy is explicit tracking of the freed location and the block bounds. And let me try to explain what I mean. If you notice me doing something with my keyboard, I'm trying to uh, get the, uh, my photo out the way. and I keep on having to move it around. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk about Gillian JS. So here is the concrete memory for Gillian JS in all its gory detail, which actually isn't so detailed, even though the language is extremely complicated, the memory model is not. 
we have locations. We have a property table. By this, we mean that properties are strings given by this curly set of strings S here. And properties have their associated values or the property is not there given by this negative, uh, this absent negative information. When you allocate, you know what properties are there or not there. We also have a domain table. The domain, again, to do with allocation, you know what properties are there and not there, so you can actually say it in a domain table and keep really close track of this. This is something that happens in the main code, but if you've got a function, you don't know what's around, so you don't have the domain table necessarily. So if you don't have the domain table, it could easily be missing and not part of the specification of a function. And so this symbol is saying the domain table is not there. So either you have a set of um, strings or you have not there. And similarly, you have some metadata that I'm not gonna talk about. The JavaScript symbolic memory model is a simple lifting. We know from lots of people's work that you can, you can um, sometimes even automatically lift symbolic memory from concrete memory. This is what we're doing in this case. And so instead of location strings and values, we have arbitrary symbolic expressions. We also need well form this condition that captures the separation of the object locations, the separations of the properties within an object, as well as connection between the domain table and the property table. And that's what this lot says. These two are saying the separation of the separation. And this one I'll go through. It's saying for the domain table, when the domain table is not missing, then the domain of the um, heap, meaning this bit here, this domain must be contained in that domain table. It's a complicated way of saying something very simple just what formalism does sometimes. Now JavaScript we know is a complicated uh, language, but actually its memory model is extremely simple. We only have six basic actions for the management of the property table, the domain table, and the meta table. These are these gets and sets, the reads and writes. And uh, so JavaScript's complicated because of the really complicated control flow. So in particular, a tiny little um, assignment has hundreds of pathways through the standard of what that means that, for that assignment. And um, that's all coped with by the compilation to the particular GIL code we end up um, verifying. The actual memory model is simple. We have three core predicates. We have this one that's very analogous to a cell assertion of separation logic. And this one says, that given a location and a property, we either get a value or we get the information that the property at this symbolic location is not there. So this hat means symbolic. We also have the domain table saying at this symbolic location, we have this symbolic set and metadata I won't explain. We have exact fixes for all actions, which means those nice correctness results hold. And just to emphasize, we have particular negative information, the information that a, prop a symbolic property is not at a symbolic um, location. And also this domain table is actually giving infinite negative information. So that's why this is good. This is really needed at the logic place, not at the symbolic memory place. This could be expressed in symbolic memory, but this one is about infinite information. It says whenever you have a symbolic string that's not in the domain table, and think how many strings you have, most is not in the, in the, in the domain table, then it is the case that um, the uh, symbolic um, property is um, not there, given by this information. So this is a finite way of saying that infinite piece of information. 
I need to give you the um, basic actions that account for this positive, negative and uh, missing information. And I'm going to talk about a particular example, which is get property, which you intuitively know it's reading the property at the location. And this is for symbolic execution, symbolic location, symbolic property. Given this symbolic location in this symbolic memory, maybe it's not there. Maybe, maybe it's not in the domain of the um, memory, in which case the object is missing. Or the symbolic, um, look, there is a match between the location at the symbolic location and the symbolic memory. There could, be, of course, be lots of matches because we're in symbolic land. But let's take one of these matches. Now, is this property in the domain of H, hat? So is this symbolic? property in the symbolic um, heap. Yes, um, then you give back the symbolic value. That's what's going on here. And it could be not there. It could be um, something that really has concrete value. Or the answer is no. In which case, either the domain table is missing. And if the domain table is missing, then you just, you haven't got that property and the property is missing. Or the domain table is not missing and the property may or may not be there. If the property is there, then it really is the case that we've got a missing property. If the property is not there, then um, actually you really know it's not there because the domain table's keeping track of what's there and what's net not there through allocation. So in this case, uh, you give back the information that the, um, there's no value there. So this is Gillian um, JS, and uh, I've given the basic actions, I've given the core, pre the core predicates, and I haven't given the um, consumers and producers, but they're variations on the theme of what I've done here. I can give um, the fixes. So here we've got an error which is missing object, and here we've got the error which is missing property. For the fixes, you could either fix by giving it a symbolic value, or you fix by giving it not the information that is not there, and you have to do both in both cases. And the reason for this is because JavaScript tries quite hard not to give error information. So it's not giving explicit errors. I'm now going to go on to Gillian C. And actually, we're really going to find that there's, it's only a variation on the theme. I'm not going to be introducing really any more concepts at all. So we have a concrete memory. It has locations. And it could be the case that the location is freed, in which case the information, the location, the information about the, inf the location is not there. So here we've got not there happening at the, um, at the level of the location rather than at the location property pair. But that's all the differences. This is how we deal with freed. Otherwise, the block is there and it's here. And the block can either be, um, the block consists of two parts, excuse me. It um, uh, gives a mapping from the, from the offsets to values, and it gives information about the bound, or that information about the bound is not there. That's again, something that might be the case for the, the function specifications. You don't have all information. You might have that information in the main part. So we have the block context, the block bound. The symbolic memory we lift as before in an automatic way. And um, actually what we do in the implementation is do a much um, more complicated uh, memory using balance trees for performance. For those of you who know Greber's, Greber's work, we're very inspired by that. But for the purpose of today, we can talk just about the lifting of the symbolic memory. We have analogous well-formedness conditions. This one means if you have 
the um, bound, then the offsets must be lower than the bound. The other parts are separation parts. We only have a small number of actions again. We only have a small number of core predicates. They are slightly different because of the slightly different structure. Here we have um, that a value, a symbolic value is associated with a symbolic offset and a symbolic location. Here we have the symbolic location has the information that the block is not there. And bound is like the um, bound is like the domain table. We have get cell, which is an action very analogous to get prop. And look, the pattern is very similar. I'm not going to go through it all. If we have a symbolic location in a memory that is not there, then you have a missing block. But it could be there. But if it's there, and uh, but there's no block, it's being freed as given by this information here, then you get an error back saying use after freed. And that error can never be fixed because it's a real error in C. Otherwise, so we can keep going, we can end up with another error called buffer overrun, or we can end up with another resource error, which is the missing cell. These resource errors can be fixed and they're fixed like this. A slight difference is that we only have one fix. You don't have the not there case because the not there case is given by specific um, errors associated with C. And apart from that, there's very simple analogies going on between the C memory model and the JavaScript memory model that we're using all the time. I'm nearly at the end of my part of the talk. I'm just going to give a minor summary of Jillian in practice, and then we're on to uh, Petter. We've done symbolic um, testing of well-used real-world code, in particular um, buckets.js for the JavaScript code and collection C for the C code. I'm not going to go into details here. We're very happy to talk about it. We've extended this work to events, and in particular, we have a general way of talking about events and then can imply, instantiate it to specific cases. We've done the cache um, uh, events module, which is a compact alternative for jQuery. And here we were focusing on boundless correctness guarantees. This is mainly Jose and a PhD student called Gabby. But what I we're focusing on today is full verification of the AWS encryption SDK message header um, manipulation with implementations in JavaScript and C. And we had the most lo lovely discussions with a group in AWS and actually Mike Dodds, who um, is part of uh, interacting with them for other reasons, I believe, to do with Gawa. And he came along and uh, very much was um, helping us uh, specifying what we should be doing. So in particular, our first project is the verification of the message header deserialization module. And what's happening at the moment for validation is either for JavaScript, we've got concrete testing or runtime correctness assertions. By runtime correctness assertions, I mean, we've got bits of extra um, uh, uh, assertion code looking like this that says a variable read pause must be non-negative and within the byte length of the buffer given. So the sort of very normal constraints that one would expect and this is tested at runtime. The same happens with C, except for also we can do bound, they do map bounding model checking using CBMC. So there's lots of CBMC annotations right the way through this. The um, size of JavaScript is 200 locations, and for C is 950 locations. And we've done it. And in particular, this is Petal for JavaScript and Sasha with a lot of help from PETA for C. And we can verify that um, the JavaScript and C deserialization modules do what they should. They correctly deserialize a well-formed header. They throw an appropriate error if there's a malformed error and give the appropriate result 
if um, there's an incomplete head. There's, um, we found bugs and fixed bugs as part of this verification work and Petra will talk about that. And we absolutely substantially improved the reasoning cap capabilities of Julian as we went along. This is the first time ever we've done verification of real code rather than verification of algorithms. And I'm sure the Gawa people know that that jump is a big jump. Our annotations are enormous. We really want to get um, better at this and have less annotations, but it is in the context that the, um, these uh, header um, module is, has been used for years. I think it's just changed slightly uh, recently, actually, and we'll change too if we need to. But the, um, absolutely, it's something that's used for years. So perhaps it might be worth it, but perhaps we've still got a long way to go. I'm just going to summarize here the Gillian project and then pass over to Peta. So this lot says, do everything better, essentially. And this lot says some new stuff. And in particular, um, Sasha is, he's just done um, the, uh, submitted the artifact evaluation that for um, CAV on this C verification work. So now he's free to really, really have a go at Rust. So no pressure there, um, Sasha. Um, but now we know it's time to do it. And then we've got more analysis to do. I want to stress because there's some related um, work that absolutely deals with concurrency. I spend a lot of my research career doing theoretical results to do with concurrency. And absolutely, I want to pull this into the Gillian framework and uh, we're nearly ready to go. I've uh, talked about incorrectness separation logic quite a bit. We're having lots of resonances and we enjoy talking to our uh, Facebook colleagues in London very much about this work. And of course, we want to do uh, interoperability. We've got a platform for many languages. So this was part of what we would like to do. I'd like to pass over to Petter now. Hi, everyone. I think, Philippa, you need to stop share screening. And here I go. So, hello, everyone. I'm going to be talking in detail about DAR specification and verification of deserialization module. This is going to be fast and this is going to be technical. So fasten your seatbelts. So what is actually the message header that we're verifying? It is a sequence of bytes that is divided into various sections. You can see all of the sections that are in the header here and you can see their length in bytes above. Most of them are of fixed length, some of them are of variable length, for example, this encryption context and these encrypted data keys. And how do we actually do the specification and verification? We built a bunch of language independent first order abstractions that capture the header structure. Then using these abstractions, we'll build some language specific ones that capture the related objects in structures and in C and JavaScript. We state and prove a bunch of lemmas about all the abstractions, and then we go and specify and verify all the functions. Here, we will focus on the encryption context and related functions, because this is a section of variable length. It's quite complex to specify and reason about, and we've actually found bugs related to it, both in JavaScript <clears throat> and in C. So now we're going to see what this encryption context actually is. And it is a list of bytes that represent a serialized list of key value pairs. It starts with two bytes that tell us how many key value pairs there are. So this, these are two bytes, and this number of key value pairs is actually obtained by converting this to an unsigned 16-bit integer. Then what follows are the key value pairs, and they all have a similar structure. So each key and each value is actually serialized by first giving two bytes that say how long the key or value actually is, and then that many bytes of the actual key and value. And we call this structure a field. Then a key value pair, we call that a two field element. So it's basically an element that has two fields, a key and a value. And then the entire encryption context is a sequence of KC, two field elements. So now we're gonna see how we build up the abstractions for this. And I was planning to show this in more detail, but I think it's going to be fairly high level. So for example, this spread, we start with the field. And we have a predicate that describes a field. And it says basically, it has four parameters, buff, pause, field, and length. 
and it says that the buffer buff contains at position pos a field that has contents field and is of total length length. And what does that mean? It means that the position has to be greater than zero. And then I need to get this field. So for that, I will first read this length by saying that it is a sublist, and this is the drill operator of a sublist. So it's a sublist of the buffer buff at position pos of length two. And so this raw FL is effectively two bytes. So then using this built-in predicate of Jillian, I convert it to a 16-bit integer, which is FLN. And then I take another sublist of the buffer, but this time starting at POS plus two and of length FLN to obtain this field. And finally, the length of the entire field is two plus FLN. And this is what it means to be a field. Then we use this abstraction to describe what it means to be a complete element. And this abstraction basically says that the buffer buff at position POS contains a complete element that has F count field. This is another parameter of the predicate with contents element. And this is just a list of field contents and is of length length. I'm not gonna show the details because this is really just like uh, your standard linked list predicate, except that the link is that these fields are contiguous in memory. And in addition to this complete element, we have an incomplete and a broken element. An incomplete element is just a part of an element that with correct structure, but that hasn't been perhaps streamed over the network completely, this can happen. Or it's a broken element, which means that this structure is just incorrect. And then on top, we have a general element abstraction that incorporates all three types of elements. <clears throat> As we went from field to element, so we go from elements to element sequences, which basically gives us another predicate, this C elements that says that the buffer buff at position pos has E count elements, each of which has F count fields. Its contents is now a list of element contents and is all of length length. And this takes us to the actual encryption context. So what does it mean for a buffer to be an encryption context with key value pairs KVS? Either it is empty and the key value pairs are empty or it's not empty, in which case I can get this raw key count, again, using a sublist that gets the first two bytes. I convert it to get an actual key count, which must be greater than zero. And then I have this complete elements, how many, KC of them. Each of them has two fields, the key and the value. And then the, their contents actually represent these key value pairs. And their entire length is this EC len. There's another um, issue that needs to be dealt with, which is the keys have to be unique. So I have to take the first projection of these key value pairs to get the keys. The keys must be unique. And the buffer must only contain the encryption context. So the encryption context is entirely in this buffer. And the length of the buffer is 2 plus this EC len. And so, that encryption context is actually part of a much larger specification. Ah, but before that, we also have, in addition to the complete encryption context, we have an incomplete and a broken one similarly to um, elements. And we have a general abstraction that incorporates all three types of uh, encryption contexts. And so this, which is you're not going to read, is the specification of the entire header. And you can see that there's a small part here that actually corresponds with the encryption context. So this is sort of the complexity of our specifications. And this was all language independent. So let's see what happens when we get to JavaScript and C. And you can see here in the footnote that now we've, so far we've only had pure predicates, but now we're gonna get language dependent resource predicates. So in JavaScript, what we have is that the serialized encryption context can be accessed using something called a uint array object, which is really a view on top of a JavaScript array buffer. And this array buffer just holds raw bytes. So this predicate says that this SEC is an object that represents a serialized encryption context with key value pairs KVS. And what does that mean? That SEC is actually a uint array on top of an array buffer called a buff. And this array buffer has some data, but the uint array actually sees only a small part of that data that starts at offset off and is of length len. And actually, when we when we isolate that part that the array buff, that the uint array sees, this EC. This EC can be now viewed as an encryption context with key value pairs KBS. And this is how the language independent part connects to the language dependent part in JavaScript. Then the, this, uh, the encryption context is deserialized into a key value map, which is essentially a JavaScript object where the keys of the encryption context correspond to the keys of the, of the properties of the uh, key value map. And the values of the encryption context 
correspond to the values of the properties. And they all have to be converted from list of bytes, which they are in the encryption context, to strings. And this is done using this two UTF-8 function. And the keys have to be unique and the resulting key value map must be frozen to prevent tampering. Um, and JavaScript, you can freeze objects, which means that their proper, the values of the properties can no longer be edited and no new properties can be added. And so we have another predicate that says that this DEC represents a deserialized encryption context with key value pairs KVS, which means that it is a frozen object. And this is a built-in predicate that, uh, that uh, JavaScript developers can use. So it's a frozen object with prototype null and carrying property value pairs PV pairs, which are now pairs of strings, the list of pairs of strings. And when I convert these pairs from UTF-8 back to bytes, I actually get the key value pairs of the encryption context. And with that, we can actually get the specification of the decode encryption context function, which takes this serialized encryption context. And you can see that in the precondition, we just have that this SEC, which is the parameter of the function, is a serialized encryption context with key value pairs KVS. In the post condition, we have the same, and plus we have the, that the return value denoted by this ret actually represents a deserialized encryption context with the same key value pairs. And that means that this function is correct. In C, um, things are similar, but slightly different because of, uh, because of simply what C is. So the serialized encryption context is accessible via something called a byte cursor structure that is designed by, by AWS. And this struct here, you can see it, it has two fields. It has len and it has buff. And what it actually means is that it sort of claims ownership over an array of unsigned 8-bit integers starting from this pointer buff and of length len. And this is captured by this predicate here, AWS byte cursor of cur, buff, and c. And what it says is that this cur is actually this struct with the fields len and buff, and then since buff is a pointer, if you remember what Philippa was saying, a pointer is sort of a block offset pair. So I'm going to destruct it into the block and the offset. And then in memory, I have an array in this block starting from this offset with content C, and that contents has length len. And you can see here that there is a predicate called struct AWS byte cursor, and these predicates we automatically generate from the definitions of the structs. So now, Getting the serialized encryption context is easy because a serial uh, because um, <clears throat> what we have is basically just an AWS byte cursor at this cur, but now the contents we denote them by EC, and we require that they can be seen as again the complete encryption context with key value pairs <clears throat> KVS. And here you can see again how the language independent and the language dependent part connect for C, and it's quite similar to the way they connect for JavaScript. Again, the encryption context is, is deserialized into a key value map of sorts, only this time it's not an object, it's an AWS C common hash table structure. So it's really a hash table, <clears throat> which means that the keys of the encryption context now become the keys of the hash table, the values become the values of the hash table, again, all converted to UTF-8. And we have that, um, and this EC, is a deserialized encryption context with key value pairs KVS. If it points to a hash table, this denoted by this hash EC, and this hash table contains these key value pairs. And again, when converted from free UTF-8, we get the key value pairs of the encryption context. So you can see there is a lot of resonance between the specifications for JavaScript and C. The specification of the deserialization function is slightly more complicated, again, because of the C details. So it takes two parameters. This cur is uh, pointing to the beginning of the serialized encryption context with contents EC and key value pairs KVS. And this EC is the resulting hash table, which in the beginning has to be empty. In the end, we have that the hash table has been filled correctly. And now we have a deserialized encryption context with key value pairs KVS. But you can see that this abstraction here, the C serialized EC has been broken. And it's been broken because the AWS byte cursor, which was pointing initially to the beginning of the array, after this function is pointing to the end of the array. And you can see it here because the offset that was like hash off here, here it's off plus the length of the EC. And since the EC has to fill the buffer completely, there is nothing left in this byte cursor. So now this concludes the very, very technical part of the specification. And there are just some caveats we need to talk about. So the original JavaScript code was written in TypeScript. We allied the types to get JavaScript. This could be automated and, and does not lose meaning. 
We support some ES6 features, but some we did rewrite to ES5 without loss of expressivity. Most of the runtime library functions that the deserializations module use, we axiomatize. We axiomatize, for example, array buffer data view of JavaScript. We axiomatize also a lot of functions in the AWSC common library. Some of the functions we do verify, and in C, we even found bugs in some of them. Some of them we just symbolically execute and don't particularly care about specifying. When it comes to higher order functions, we have also two approaches. We either axiomatize them, such as the two UTF-8 function, which converts list of bytes to strings. We just axiomatize it as an injective function, or we specialize them by, um, uh, for example, um, the ArrayList library of AWSC Common, which is higher order. We have to specialize it for this particular data type that it um, that the header requires, which are encrypted data keys. So now that was specification. There's also verification and it carries a lot of complexity. It requires a lot of automatic and manual reasoning about things like list concatenation, sublists, uh, sublists of lists of symbolic size with symbolic content, which is now automated and is part of the first order solver of Jillian. Um, also things like first projections of lists of pairs, element uniqueness, list set conversion, um, most importantly, manipulation of all the user-defined predicates. So lots and lots of lemmas, some unfolding, luckily folding is automatic. Getting the annotations right is very complicated. So to illustrate this, here is the main loop of the decode encryption context function of JavaScript. So we need to set up and establish the loop invariant, and we need to re-establish the invariant afterwards. To set the invariant up, we need four tactics and like 27 invariant components. This is it here. To reestablish it, we need to apply a bunch of lemmas, like eight of them, and then do one last tactic in order to reestablish the invariant and get the structure right. There is absolutely no time for me to show the actual verification. I will show it as the questions go. And finally, to summarize the bugs, we found two bugs in JavaScript, three bugs in C. In JavaScript, both were found in the decode encryption context function. The first one we predicted in our original paper on Javert, it's a type of prototype poisoning bug, and we found it here in the wild, we found it in cache, we found it in jQuery. And what it says is if a key of the encryption context coincides with the property of object of prototype, an exception will be thrown. The other bug is more like a vulnerability because in one scenario, the deserialized encryption context was returned non-frozen. And this allows third parties to add and remove keys from this context after authentication. So this is non-secret but authenticated data. So this is possibly, uh, this, this, this does constitute an issue. When it comes to C, in the AWS C common library, we found that each string over allocates eight additional unused bytes. We found that one of the functions can exhibit undefined behavior. It does only add null plus zero and lots of compilers can deal with that and do deal with that, but this is technically undefined behavior. But the most interesting thing was again in the function that decodes the encryption context, which had a logical error. And um, in the case where there were not enough bytes to read the encryption context, instead of stopping, parsing does not stop and it continues to parse the next section of the header, which are the encrypted data keys. And this actually allows malformed headers to be parsed as correct. This is a fairly serious one. So now the things we can do with Amazon to continue this work is perhaps the verification of the serialization function, which is quite difficult. Uh, results saying that uh, serialization, deserialization are each other's inverses. And it would be really nice to try and integrate the verification with Amazon infrastructure. I have a very ambitious goal, which is to try and understand what does it mean to get academic verification sort of towards industry? What are the limitations? You've seen the amount of annotation. It's all very, very difficult and we are hoping to understand what, what the bound is. There's also symbolic testing, which is much easier for developers. If the serialization, for example, proves too hard to verify, we can try and do bound correctness with symbolic testing. We can try to symbolically test Amazon, other Amazon code. We, I, we might be fairly ready for that. And uh, one of the things when talking to developers that they really expressed um, a great desire for was to get some sort of feedback in their ID of choice, for example, VS Code, and we are working on that as well. And here, the goal that we have is, we believe, much more reachable, which is basically to provide a pathway for developers to write systematic symbolic tests instead of their concrete tests. And there, we, we think there, there is something to do here. We are really excited to see what Julian Rust will do once it's ready on Amazon code, especially given the focus of Amazon on Rust that is, that is growing. So with this, we conclude. Thank you. And if you have any questions, please go ahead as the verification of JavaScript continues. I have a very quick question. 
uh, it's a high level question. So you showed the bunch of specification and then you showed the verification, which was applying taxi tactics and all this, these things. In what system is all that? So like, I, I kind of missed that. Uh, like what, what is, what is the, like, if you just give me pointers, where would I read? What is the system that you're using? Like what are valid tactics and so on? Oh, uh, we don't really have that particularly documented. I mean, it will be in, in part two, some of it, and then we need to provide documentation. So it's, uh, it's our symbolic execution. And then you have things like folding, unfolding predicates, capturing part of your state. It's sort of things that you would like, we would write in, in, in like a proof sketch in separation logic, something like that. Okay, but so this, this whole thing is Jillian. Jillian is not just This whole thing execution. is Jillian. Yes. Okay, so I was imagining you use Jillian and then you use Coq or something like that. But no, 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 this is all in Jillian. Like actual verification system in it. Ah, no, 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 this is all in Jillian. And, and to read about that, uh, do you guys have a publication or something about what is the actual, like the, I don't know if you've seen, but the equivalent of our soul. Because we've had a lot of issues with kind of designing the actual language in which you write all of these things. Uh, yeah, we, we, we need to get the right documentation in order. So do get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do. There's, there's, there's not a specific like list of things that we, can, that we can give you right now. So as the questions are going, this was the verification of JavaScript. We can see lots of lemmas being verified, lots of specs being verified. These N's and D's just means that the path has concluded successfully and the S means that this has been a success, et cetera, et cetera. I will do now the same for C, and this will take five or six minutes, and it's not clear it will finish by the time this talk ends. I have, yes, I have a question. Go ahead, Simon. Um, can you talk a bit about, like, you have sort of roughly, what, four times as many lines of annotation as you do, like, uh, code? Is, is that about right? Like 4K to 1K sort of thing? Between, between 3 and 4K, yes, let's say. But it's it's sufficiently dramatic, yes. Um, can you, like, what are you doing there, right? So is it, like, all kinds of stuff, or is it, is it dominated by, like, do, do you have to kind of, for example, um, show the kind of framing, you know, how the frames are decomposed, for example, manually? Like, what are you doing no, there? No, frames are not, the, frames are, no, no, not that. It's really... It's, it's definitions of the predicates. It's the lemmas associated with the predicates. I can perhaps show some of that if I manage to find them. It's, um, no, where is it? It's in here. So it's things like this. It's really just definitions of predicates, definitions of predicates, definitions of predicates, lots and lots and lots of them. And they are reusable, which is a good thing. So a, a lot of the things for JavaScript, we could just reuse for C. And then for example, for C, for C, for C, for C, when I get it, so here in this header, you really have lots of annotations. And these are the tactics that, that the gentleman before was asking about. So it's basically applying lemmas, unfolding, doing tactics in one case, doing tactics for the other case, asserting some parts, stating the invariant, some unfoldings. It's, it's mostly, it's mostly invariants and lemma application, I would say. So but there's a lot, think, like, there's a lot of abstractions. So maybe, so there, there's a lot of specification, which I understand, but do you think some of this stuff could be um, reduced with further automation or is that like- uh, It would be interesting. Forward? It would be interesting to try and get automated lemma application, but this is very, very difficult to get the order right. So perhaps the unfolding of predicates, but the thing is this is real world code, real world code and to get the invariance right. And we have to have invariance. We can't infer invariance at the moment. We, we just have yeah. to have a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, annotations. Thanks. You can see in the background, the main function of C is getting parsed. This will take, given the resources of my computer, at least some five or six minutes more. I, I think there's something going on in chat. I don't quite know who's moderating. I, uh, I don't know. Uh, are there any other questions? Yes, I, I just typed a question in, but I'll, I'll say is. Oh, it yes, out. yes, I see. Yes, go for yeah. it. Yeah, you, you could read it. Basically, I, I'm slightly confused about the dependencies here. You're in the, your narrative, your assertions seem to be verifying that the encryption context 
has a certain length and you're looking at whether the given bytes has is well formed within that. Um, but in practice, isn't it usually the case that you only know the length by decoding it? I mean, it's the information in the data that tells you what the length should be. Yes. And in that sense, and there is case. no known yeah, length. Yeah. For, there is no known no length so, for it other than the bytes have not arrived yet. So what actually happens is that these predicates, you can think of them, I'm going to do something now, I'm going to edit the presentation like. So this is what happens. You basically know these two, and then you will learn these two as you go, which is, I think, what you would intuit, because these predicates have something called in and out parameters. And if you know the ins, then you get all the outs. I see. So I should think so, of them like logic variables that could be- Absolutely. And you can see here that I'm doing, for example, in this Ewing 16, I have this raw FL that I've learned before, but this FLEN is something I'm learning now. And then I continue, and then I continue. And we have a unification that goes from the ins to the outs, and it's fully parametric. I see. I mean, that's a really good catch. In the meantime, the C is to verify. So, I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so, in the presentation, it's mentioned that uh, you are thinking of applying Gillian to some DSLs. Can you? Uh, Tell us what type of DSLs you're going to use. Uh, we are looking for people okay. to give us DSLs. We don't have any. Yeah. We really like, if you have a DSL, what can, can we do something maybe? Because the thing is that we are on very complicated real world languages. We're on JavaScript, we're on C, we're on this and that. We could perhaps, you know, we could use a smaller language and see what we can do. We wouldn't mind entirely. What do you anticipate as any new challenges you'll see with Rust that you didn't see with JS or with C? Sasha, do you want to answer that? If you're there. So why don't I go? I'm not sure whether where um, what's here. happened to Sasha. He's been um, answering questions, but he seems not to be there. Um, no, no, he is there. He's, he's just arrived. Ah, uh, he's back. Sasha, yeah. answer. Can you can you repeat the question, please? I I would climbing the stairs when you asked. Uh, yes, I, I was just curious uh, in your your new work moving on to Rust, what what new challenges do you expect to face that you didn't already see with JS or with C? Um, that's actually quite interesting. The, the next one I'm expecting is, well, things to do with lifetimes because we plan on verifying uh, unsafe Rust so we kind of need to reestablish the type invariance before and after the unsafe bits of Rust. And that includes things like lifetime. And I don't know how much Gillian is able to reason about those things right now. And also uh, Rust is very different from C and JavaScript in the sense that it's very, very static, much more than JS, but also more than C because of the very, very static types. And Gillian has really been thought to reason about uh, dynamic things. So in theory, it should be simpler, but also we don't really know how to handle that. Can I just come in also just to say that um, it's our first little step for interoperability in the sense that one has uh, the safe Rust code working on a high level memory model. And then there's the low level view of memory um, that very much uh, like a C memory model. And we're going to have to go back and forth between the two, uh, which is, for us is delightful. That's just where we want to be. Yes. For example, it seems to me that the, what was already remarked in terms of the number of lines of codes of annotations that you had, some of it may be an artifact of the fact that it's JS or C and might be much smaller with, with Rust. Absolutely. And how much do we just focus on the Rust types and see what we get? We don't know. But definitely one thing I can say is those predicates we wrote for C, first of all, would be kind of derived automatically if it was Rust. And at the same time, there's a lot of ownership going on in those predicates that I think Rust likes. Also, it would come for free. Like we don't, we wouldn't have to write those predicates. It would just be derived from the code.
So thank, thank you for the questions. Are there any other ones? I seem to be moderating now. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's going on. Shall we say goodbye to everybody and just say thanks so much for um, listening. Please get in touch if you have more questions. You can find our emails. I'm sorry we pushed the timing a bit. I think I was joshing with um, uh, Mike Dodds a little bit too freely at the beginning. So excuse me for um, doing that. And I, uh, we, as I said, we were in Galwa in 2018 and actually I had this sort of little bit of a plan that um, I would we would come back and talk about Gillian at some point um, and you know events have taken over so thank you so much for letting us doing it do it in this virtual way at least. Yeah. And that's very nice whoever wrote the thanks on the screen. That's oh. <laughs> We can possibly wait for one minute more for the seat to actually finish verifying. If any <laughs> other questions come up and then we will go. Yeah, do you know, is it nearly done? <laughs> yes, I do know, it's very nearly done. But the thing is that the Zoom and the, the share screen are taking a lot of my resources, so I can't just oh, okay. do it in full speed. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing about demoing proofs, you know, it's kind of... Yeah, yeah, just runs and says done. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I could, I, I could, I could have run the JavaScript line in the presentation, but I wanted to do the C as well. And you can see that it's much, much more complicated than JavaScript. Yeah. Um, well, it sounds like there's no more questions, so we can wrap it up. It seems I, I thought that Mike would wrap it up, but it seems that he's probably gone. Usually there's. I no think Mike's gone. gone. Yeah. Mike so said in his chat he had to come. Mike is gone, and the C verification is done. You can Yay! see it took around Yay. ten minutes. <laughs> Normally it takes six minutes. <laughs> So I think yeah. this is really the right place to stop. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>